It's a real pleasure to, to welcome you all to this session uh, about the success stories of, uh, in the field of artificial intelligence in, in AI, uh, in, in cancer imaging cancer. Uh, we are thrilled to, to, to have such uh, distinguished uh, uh, experts with us today uh, sharing their time and their expertise with, with us to enrich the, uh, the communication. So let's uh, present, let's introduce uh, first Vladan uh, Zrakovic. <coughs> he comes from Serbia. He's project manager at Bizaris, a leading company specialized in the field of digital X-ray uh, imaging and diagnostic workflow. And Bizaris participates in Incisive, having an important role in models training. So welcome, Vladan. Next, we have uh, Dr. Javier Sanchez. He's from Madrid. He's clinical scientist leader in South Europe at Philips. He has expertise in magnetic resonance, signal acquisition, reconstruction, and analysis, uh, focusing during the last 10 years in the field of cardiovascular MRI. And he has contributed in more than 90 uh, peer review pu publications and book chapters. So welcome. Then we have uh, Mario Aznar. He's director in Magical Innovation, a company based on, on Madrid. He, he's expert in R&D, financing, entrepreneur, and business strategist. He has more than 10 years of experience in business development and international innovation management. And he participates in several projects presented today, being sustainability coordinator for Primat, Chameleon, and UKM projects. So welcome. And uh, next we have, uh, we are privileged to have uh, Paul Lopez. He comes from Barcelona. He's the head of informational technology office of the Catalan Institute of Health. This institution includes eight uh, hospitals and about 300 uh, primary care. Uh, it provides health to almost 6 million users. And Paul has a background in managing the information technology area in different health institutions in Catalonia. And finally, but not least, uh, we have Miguel Javier Acreta. He's biomedical engineer in La Fe Health, Insti health Institute. Uh, he has a technical background in medical imaging, being expert in the analysis and graphic, uh, graphical visualization of data and the design of graphs for that interpretation. So we are grateful to, to have your insights today. Javi. So now I'll pass the floor uh, to each of you uh, to share your projects and, and perspectives. So, Vlad, the, the floor is yours. Uh, hello. Uh, so I'm Vlad Zrakovic. I'm from Serbia. Uh, I'm from Serbia. 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 I'm from too much time to, to go in that uh, detail because they, they explain it very well. But uh, let's put it to three major points. So the first one is how to convince uh, medical professionals uh, to use AI tools. Uh, then how to improve precision because if we want successful tools, we really need to be good. And finally, how to back up results in histopathological data because I think this is the key point if we want to succeed with, with medical professionals. Oh, sorry. Is it better now? Uh, so, uh, impact. Today we already see impact uh, uh, as assistive technology. Uh, Visaris has uh, devices that are using AI firstly to improve the speed, to save the time for professionals. And uh, it's, uh, there are three aspects of, of saving time. First is automatic image orientation, because when specialists uh, or radiologists, in, in this case, receives image, it's then uh, it can be in various orientation. Especially an inexperienced people need the time to help with that. So in a millisecond, they get uh, all positioned image in the right way. Then positioning and enlargement and focus. Uh, 
But I will take another case. So this is completely assistive technology. It is not uh, determine cancer or anything like that. We are on about 70% precision. So it's still a far away for good results. But I'll put another uh, case and that's Revive. That's the uh, UK company that uh, Visaris has also staked in it. And uh, this is uh, automatic reporting that is NLP uh, AI that's, uh, that is able to automatically uh, make uh, reports, uh, find diagnosis much better than even a uh, medium doctor. And um, in, uh, in cancer detection, there is actually precision 96, 97%. It is for melanoma and skin cancer that are easier to detect because they are on the surface. So we, don't, we are not dealing with radiology images like in other cases that we hear today, but with uh, simple, um, it, it works even with mobile phone, but best works with the dermatoscope. So here we have precision, and it is also important because this uh, question was raised, but never came to the data. A uh, young professional in determining cancer, in, in, in this uh, case melanoma and skin, has success rate about 70-75%. AI has 95%. So actually, we, it's, it's not a question if, if it's useful. It's of course useful, but the, the issue is that, okay, we're not allowing technology, computers, to make decision. And because of that, we are allowing doctors who are simply not experienced to make bad decisions. Uh, and this is clearly the situation today. And this is the impact that technology could have. <coughs> Yesterday, a colleague of ours said, it is not a question. And, and the major really afraid is that technology will replace doctors. And uh, this is not my quote, but from our colleague here. It's not a question if. Uh, the technology will replace doctors, but the doctors who are not using technology will be replaced. I think this is what will happen. So, we have uh, still uh, challenges. The first is uh, find better, more precise solutions. I think that the whole community should work on that. Back it, in, uh, back it with data, and we hear today that several projects working aggressively on that, and that's uh, important and educate because people need education, both patients and medical doctors. <coughs> so, yeah, uh, in, on aspect of education, at this moment, uh, for us, it's the main test to explain how to choose the right tool because we see uh, constantly that people are doctors mostly, but also uh, some other professionals are using wrong tools for, for the right uh, uh, task. <laughs> what are features available for them, and how much users can depend on results. Thank you. No, no question, yes, later. Okay, now Javier will explain his experience in a big company, such as Philips. Thank you for the kind of invitation. So, well, I don't know my slides are, okay, so probably, okay. So, well, the first thing that we need to ensure is uh, also uh, we are talking all the, the whole morning about uh, data analysis and image, uh, patient image analysis. The first thing that we should uh, ensure is just to provide access to the imaging to every patient or most of the patients. So, well, and then we, have, we can work in two different aspects. So patient preparation, that is one thing that is also taking time and it needs to be considered. And is where AI also can play a big role. But today, as an imaging company, as this is, so I will be focused on acquisition and reconstruction as well. So this is one access. So if we talk about the image access to the, uh, to the, tech, to the patient, so the first thing that we should uh, ensure is, OK, for CT probably, just uh, reduce the dose. So AI is playing a big role there, where you can train different networks on different AI algorithms in order to reduce the noise in a way that you can lower the dose to the patient. So here is a good example where we can acquire very low uh, dose data with a lot of noise in it 
and then use AI in order to improve. I, I think this is a good example what the AI can do in order to provide more access to the imaging to the patient. On MR, it's always uh, about time. Time is a key element in MR. It's, uh, you want to do like a very high resolution images. Time is a, a limitation factor there. And then we can play clearly with a combination between different acquisition schemes and also putting in, internally AI algorithms to do like kind of denoising or image processing. And I think that this is where also AI can play a big role there that can improve the access to the images. Here are some examples, so it's <laughs> not easy to see due to the setup. But you see that there are images with a similar acquisition time, but you can acquire more and more definitive, more resolution and more definitive data. So that will help also to the diagnosis of the patient. But also you can explore further limits that you never explored before because you have a limitation of signal to noise. And AI can allow you to go to those limits that never happens before. So the, the, the next thing is also, okay, how we can help in the diagnosis. So we need to be focused not only to, re, not to replace the, the physicians, it's also to, to help them in order to do like the work that it's routinely done and uh, need to be reduced the workload that is uh, producing all this. So we see AI as a tool for image processing in order to, to reduce all the manual uh, and manual uh, needs for the physician to get a diagnosis. So we have different solutions in there, like a lung segmentation, a liver segmentation to assess different factors. But I want to be focused today in, in a task that is very time consuming, that is probably just to count the number of uh, nodes that you have in the, in the, lymph, uh, in the lymph nodes. And it's, uh, if you want to do properly, you want to count all these uh, different nodes, you need to be very careful and you go by one by one. And it's something that normally radiologists cannot do because it's super time consuming. So it's where AI can play a central role there because you can train an AI to provide, I mean, to do the, to do the, the exercise for the, radio, for the radiologist or the oncologist and later just use those results. So and this is a result of the, what the AI can do on this, on this aspect, just always uh, looking for uh, reduce the workload for the, for the physician. Also, in this respect, we are working in collaboration with different companies, and now we uh, just announced like a week ago also that we have an agreement with Kibbing also to explore the technology that they are developing in combination with the acquisition for process Thank you. Thank you. Adios. Now, now Mario will explain the success of story of Primage project. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much to the decisive team in general and to Jana in particular for the invitation to be, to be here today with all of you. Um, okay, pretty much. Um, pretty much was a project that uh, started like five years ago, but it was ideated a year before that. And as you can see there, we wanted to, to design a project uh, focused on personalized diagnosis, prognosis, and uh, using imaging biomarkers for uh, cancer, for cancer di diagnosis and, and uh, prediction of, of treatment response. The question was the focus, the, focus, the, the, the kind of cancer. At that time, um, like um, very prevalent cancer like lung, breast, prostate, colorectal, etc., uh, were on the table, but pediatric cancers were not that um, uh, covered by, by R&D projects in Europe. So we decided to, to focus on pediatric cancers, regardless the lack of data, because these uh, cancers I'm going to mention, they are rare diseases, rare, rare cancers, neuroblastoma and diffuse intrinsic one-time glioma. But um, we decided that the challenge was uh, worth the effort. So as you can see there, um, neuroblastoma is the most frequent solid cancer of early childhood, 7% of childhood malignancy. Um, imaging is very important using CT or MRI um, as well as bone marrow biopsy to deliver presurgical risk stratification. Um, so um, progress to enable early, uh, earlier detection of neuroblastoma is high risk in high risk patients is very much needed 
or was very bad in it at, at the age that diagnosis has proven to be a crucial factor in the neuroblastoma prognosis. Also for DIPG, uh, this um, kind of rare cancer um, in the childhood is the leading co cause of brain tumor related death in children. Due to the position of DIPGs deep in the brain and close to vital structures, DIPG uh, biopsy is not an available option. And DIPG is diagnosed, diagnosed using MRI or CT scan. So as you can see in both cases, uh, the use of in silico virtual tools um, to try to, to get a, a better diagnosis and, and prognosis of treatment response was very important. However, as you can see at the bottom, I don't know if you all can see it, can see it but um, data is the most important asset, and data is all. If you have no data, if we have no data, there is no game. Um, so this was one of the main challenges we faced um, at the beginning of the project. For some reason, we, um, we were not aware of how difficult and how important it was to, to have everything um, uh, ready uh, with the ethical committees, with the data sharing agreements and all that. So uh, that was, um, yeah, that was a challenge for the project. In addition to that, we uh, faced the COVID-19. Uh, it burst in front of our faces, so that added more delay to the project. And uh, as I mentioned already, um, the focus diseases were rare diseases, so the kind of data that uh, was available that, or that we could access to um, was little, uh, talking about big data and models, etc. However, however, the, the, project, the project progressed. Um, we gathered data, imaging, and also uh, clinical and molecular data. And this was from retrospective studies, not clinical trials, so we had to do a, a, a whole task of digging in retrospective data and harmonize it and put it together and yeah, and we created uh, repositories of data for the, for both projects. Um, we also created uh, radiomic biomarkers. We we extracted radiomic biomarkers. Uh, we developed in silico in silico modeling of solid tumors, multi-scale, and finally we integrated all of that into a clinical um, deci uh, clinical decision support system prototype uh, for diagnosis, prognosis, and therapies. As a result of that, of, of all that, and after five years of, of project, um, more than 59 publications were released by pretty much 40 projects' results were achieved. Not all of them were of, uh, of high relevance, but um, many of them are, are very, very, very relevant. Um, there are three that I've rescued here uh, that were nominated or identified by the Innovation Radar. The Innovation Radar is an European Commission initiative to identify promising results provided by uh, European projects. And yet here you can see three of them, computing tools for the processing of an analysis of imaging data, multi-scale modeling of tumor growth and progression, and platform for the collection, exploration, and analysis of clinical data. And finally, <coughs> at the right, you can see the, the ways of sustainability for, for pretty, much, pretty, much, pretty much has ended. Pretty much ended in, um, uh, in summer this year. And, but good news is that we gathered the interest of the European Society for Pedi Pediatric Oncology, CIOPE, for uptaking pretty much platform as the imaging management tool for, for their um, action, for their researchers. In addition to that, through EUCAIM, the data repositories and related tools will continue, will, will still be um, at the disposal of, of, of researchers. And, and that's it. Uh, despite pretty much it has ended, it will continue with different initiatives. So I think it's a success story of a project that has concluded and it is somehow continuing and it's, it's going to uh, have a voice still. Thank you, Mario, for this. So, very interesting uh, presentation. Now we have uh, Pau. Yes, the floor is yours.
That's not all. <clears throat> Thank you for being here, for being and here our project. The DigiPatics uh, is a project that belongs to the area of digital pathology. Digital pathology is not... Uh, we, we, we are in the same way that uh, is going radiology. Uh, the radiology begins with ICOM, begins with uh, sharing matches, and now we are in the same way. We are we, we trying to, to do this, this kind of transformation, digital transformation. And our project, they want to be uh, a challenge for the digital for the pathologies. It's a project that we want to change the, the way they work, the, 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 uh, the tools they use, and they um, take away the microscope and go to, the, um, to see in, in the TV. The, TV, the, the, the images. This project begins in the 2019. In, the, in September, we, we, we have found all the federal uh, projects, and uh, this is the, the, the project that we want to, to make. And, now, and uh, today is working in all the hospitals, in the seven hospitals, in the seven departments of the digital uh, the, the anatomy pathologies, and eight hospitals because one of the of the departments uh, works for two uh, hospitals. In this case, uh, the first the solutions we make is for if uh, there is technological people here. The, the solutions we make here is first at all deployment of 24 scanners. We include uh, right field and dark field, uh, two two scanners for right field and one scanner for the uh, dark field because this uh, right field is the most important in, in, in pathologies. But uh, for this, we make two uh, scanners. If the one is off, the other one is, is working. And if the workload or the work list they have, it can bring with this solution. We also re redesign the pathologies process. It's very important when you want to make one project of this kind to, to see all the project, to see all the process that is working in, in the, in the with the pathologies, we create an, a, new, a new LAIS because uh, the system that we have was very, very, very older, and we think yeah, we need to to connect this uh, this system with the scanners, with with the interf uh, AI, and this uh, which must change the, the system. Also, we incorporate here the university. In this case, Catalonian Polytechnic University to make the algorithms. We think that is, is, is two, two public institutions brings and develop these, uh, these algorithms. We, make the, we, we have the pathologists, they have the technicians. And this is uh, the joint that we became to develop these algorithms. For developing these algorithms, also we must to construct one platform, a platform that the, the, the can bring this uh, amount of data because each image of, uh, of anap the digital anatomy is 1.5 gigabytes of information, more than 30, 30 images, for example, of radiology. And this is uh, one of the thing things that this project not began before, because uh, the technology, they must bring the infrastructure that we must to buy and to deploy was very, very expensive but very difficult to, to deal with. And in the solution, uh, also the, the last part is how to uh, store this amount of data. We are thinking that we have an, uh, now 1.5 million slides digitalized in these years. Uh, each, each image is one gigabyte, is one petabyte, 1.5 petabytes that we have now in the system. This is not por uh, possible if you have not another institution, in, in our case, the Catalonia Health Service that provides to us this storage to the, to the image. And uh, in down you can see first the one, the scanners. These scanners can put uh, 1,000 1, slides for one. And the second one is how they are working now to, 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 uh, to, to, to images. And uh, the other thing is the, all the algorithms we have now. We have four algorithms deployed and, and constructed. The impact. Well, the first one is the is the network. The network with 1,068 pathologies working together. You can share your case with another pathologist. You can see the, the information. You can see this case is, is pathologies. For example, we have uh, Virgil Cinta, one hospital, 
with a little uh, group of pathologies. You can share in the moment they match with the another specialist, doctor, pathologist that is in other center and brings his opinion of this case. This is a, a reality now. You are going with the slides uh, in, in, in the car. Also, uh, we have a standardized to DICOM. You, as a radiologist case, as you, you say, you begin with, with DICOM, but not in pathology is a standard. But now we, uh, we assume that this is a standard we can deal with. When we begin, not, not more than not two providers have DICOM as a standard to, come, to begin to, to explode uh, and analyze the image. Uh, also, we have developed these uh, four algorithms in breast cancer, uh, KC uh, Center 7067, uh, HER2, uh, uh, receptor the persistent and receptors are estrogen receptors. This is the four algorithms that we now are deployed in the, for the pathologies. They are working with, the, with them, and we develop the basis for now another algorithms. We now we can feel and we can see where is the, the cell, where is the membrane, where is the, the tissue, where is the stone, and we can uh, we expect that in the future with these uh, elements we developed during these four years, we can make another algorithms quickly and faster than now. Thanks, Pau, for this so interesting presentation and now it's time for Javier Miguel. Well, <coughs> hello, uh, I'm going to present uh, the briefly the integration of the imaging data and the clinical data in the hospital data warehouse and the uh, uh, radiology extension for a mock that we are using in, in some projects. Uh, first of all, to put you in some context, I'm going to explain briefly the data flow in the hospital. In the blue environment, in the blue zone, we can see the clinical environment of the hospital, where uh, several service applications uh, collect the data uh, every day, minute by minute, and then uh, send it to our data warehouse, where the information is structured and. Um, uh, able to and uh, we are able to do data analysis with this information we also have the uh, imaging devices that collect data, uh, images every day also and send it to the packs that is our uh, storage system for images and this was our first challenge that was uh, integrating all the information extracted from DICOM studies to our data warehouse uh, this is our first challenge as, as challenge, as I said, and our second challenge was to, uh, well, yeah, uh, in the uh, research environment, uh, map all this information that, that uh, is in our data warehouse, now uh, they identified because it's a research environment, map this information into a CDM model. In our case, it's a mob because uh, La Fe Hospital used this uh, CDM model and is a extended model in the health field. And with this CDM uh, model uh, constructed, we can share data much easier in projects like Chai Million as data providers or, federate, or, or as federated nodes in EU EUKIM, for example. Well, uh, our solution uh, to, first of all, to integrate uh, the imaging data in the data warehouse was uh, a simply tag extraction from the DICOM studies and uh, ingest, uh, and ingest these uh, tags from the DICOM into a, a data mart inside our data warehouse. Now with this data mart, uh, we have all the clinical data and imaging data in the same uh, server and in the same uh, database to uh, make analysis uh, with all the information. Then we pseudonymize this information, and in another uh, server and totally separated, we have all the identified information for do research. And with this information, we have uh, used a draft of OTSI, uh, of a radiology extension, to map this information into a mock. Uh, <coughs> this uh, radiology extension is being tested in, in the impact data project. 
um, and nowadays is being tested, as I say, and consists of uh, basically two new tables for the imaging information. The imaging occurrence table that have like the raw data extracted from the image, the DICOM tags uh, extracted di directly, and the imaging feature that uh, have the post-processing information about the image, like uh, segmentation information or uh, radiomic features or some other biomarkers, for example. And we also have uh, had to create a custom voc vocabulary for this model because OMOP uh, didn't uh, collect um, concepts for radiology information. So we uh, developed a custom vocabulary with, uh, for example, Radlex and uh, implement it into our radiology extension. With, this, we, with all of this implemented, we can uh, share in a more standard way the information thanks to the CDM like OMOP. The impact of all of, of this, well, uh, having the clinical data and the imaging data uh, inter, uh, integrated in the same place uh, make us uh, so, uh, make the uh, analysis much complex because of the increment of variables and so on. And also another impact that is important is that the, with the use of CDMs, in our case OMOP, we can uh, easily interoperate with other centers in European projects and share data much more, much easier. That's all. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. Well, in, in conclusion, uh, we, we all agree that implementing uh, AI solutions in the healthcare sector uh, presents several challenges, but uh, the vision and courage of individual uh, like our panelists here uh, give an example for embracing this technology. We've seen success stories in childhood cancer research uh, the implementation of digital pathology in, in models in public healthcare systems. Uh, we've also seen the, advanta the advances in medical image acquisition and reconstruction from uh, a big company as Philips. Uh, we also seen the, um, how artificial intelligence can help healthcare professionals to save time and finally uh, we've seen also solutions for the interoperability of such complex uh, projects. So our panelists uh, represent different uh, facets, faces uh, of the implementation of AI tools in the healthcare uh, sector. Let us carry the lessons learned today in our respective fields, uh, fostering a collective commitment for realizing the full potential of artificial intelligence in improving healthcare outcomes. Thank you all for being part of this engaging uh, session. <laughs>